Uh, but John Hall here in particular has asked for shallow questions. Um, so feel free to bring those as well. But if you have a question you'd like to ask, feel free to start lining up. Um, if you do not ask questions, this is going to be really boring. So. Or we can make up stuff. <laughs> so in any case, there was this guy named John Lyons, and he had written a book about the kernel of the system, uh, system three system, you know, Linux, uh, AT and T Unix, and he had commented on all of the lines in the kernel, and he had written a separate book, which was a commentary on why these particular algorithms were chosen and stuff. Interesting. And he would he gave this back to Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, and they would look at it, and they would agree, they make comments, they pass it back. And then he would make copies of intermediate inter intermediate uh, versions of this and give it out to the students so the students could ask questions. Is this clear? Is this not clear? And stuff. And so he was just about to publish these two books, the source code with the comments and the commentary, when AT&T changed their licensing and said he couldn't publish it. And so for 20 years, it was not published. However, the bad news was for AT&T was that the students took their copies and photocopied them. And then photocopies of the photocopies and photocopies of the photocopies and photocopies. And for a long time, you would tell about where you were in the Unix hierarchy by what generation photocopy. You had. <laughs> and I had a third generation photocopy, which is still fairly readable. By the time you got to a tenth generation photocopy, it was kind of like white paper. So, after a number of years, after about 20 years, John was diagnosed with a brain disease. He was going to die. So some of his friends went to the copyright holder of the code at the time and said, please, could you publish this 20-year-old code in the kernel? Now, some of these friends were Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, Peter Solis, you know, Mark Shuttleworth, Lee yeah, yeah, Storfoss, yeah. B, and a bunch of others. Yeah, and the copyright holder was Doug Michaels and Squirrel. Now this is the good SCO, not the evil SCO. Okay. This is Doug and Larry Michaels who started SCO, they, yeah, they SCO Unix and stuff. And Doug Michaels said, sure, and he wrote a special license that they could publish this 20-year-old code and, you know, in this book, and they got Wiley to publish it, and they, they did a really great job in the book. And on the cover of the book, it shows these two students sitting in front of a photocopying machine, you know, making copies. And it was called John Lyons' Commentary on Version 6 Units. So John got to see his book published, and then he died. So a couple of years later, University of New South Wales, which John taught, wanted to create a secret. And it takes about a million and a half hours to create a permanent seat. The seat was to have a professor who would teach people how to write good code. Because that's why John wrote the book in the first place. He felt the way to, to get people to write good code was to show them good code that was written by good programmers. Right, yeah. And uh, so they went to create the seat, and they raised about half the money. And then they came to use Nix, when I was on the board, and said, could you donate some money to this? Then our president said, okay, we'll do a matching thing. Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to 20th anniversary Linux Fest, past, present, and future Q&A session. Um, this is the first time we This started as a, an idea during one of our planning sessions. We've got some great speakers coming up that, gener that represent a lot of knowledge across the life of Linux and open source. And we thought it would be really fun to be able to ask them a few questions. Um, so we organized this session. Um, if you are not sitting behind this desk and feel like you should, I'm sorry, maybe next year. <laughs> um, so we'll be taking your questions. If you want to line up on either side of the room, we'll be bringing your, set, your questions up to the board, and then we will bring them up to the panel. Um, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Um, we don't bite, usually. Um, and so with that, I'll let our presenters introduce themselves. Hello, my name is John Mad Dog Call. I've been, this is my 50th year of programming. I started in 1961. <laughs> Since 1980, I've been working on Unix systems, and since 1994, when I met Linus Torvalds, it's mostly, almost exclusively Linux and free software. And the reason I was taking pictures of you was at one time when I started going to conferences and talking about Unix or Linux, 
my boss said to me, Mad Dog, who in the heck would ever come to hear you talk about free software? <laughs> <laughs> so I started taking pictures of the audience as it kept growing and growing, and I would show it to him, and he just couldn't believe it. So thank you all for coming. Hi, uh, so my name is Kyle Rankin, and I um, work as a Chief Security Officer at Purism, a company that does uh, security and privacy focused laptops that run free software. Um, I also am a longtime columnist for Linux Journal Magazine, um, and I've been written a number of books over the years on different aspects of Linux and security. Um, and I got started with Linux because, like many people, I experimented in college. In my case, it was with Linux. Um, <laughs> and have been hooked ever since. My name is Simon Quigley. Um, I'm 17 years old. I'm, um, I'm an Ubuntu core developer. Um, I'm the Lubuntu release manager, Debian developer. Um, I do uh, various tasks within the uh, Ubuntu and Debian communities. And um, I also work for Alta Speed Technologies as the director of operations, and I'm an executive producer for the Ask Noah Show. Got 50 years of Unix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are our prospects for getting a better operating system? <laughs> well, the thing is, uh, from my viewpoint, I'm not saying that Unix or Linux is the best operating system. Um, and I think that there are different operating systems for different places. For example, TinyOS from Stanford is pretty interesting, particularly for very small devices. Um, however, I will point out that in the early days of Linux, Alan Cox actually ported Linux to a Palm Pilot, which had no memory management system and only two megabytes of memory. Uh, with that two megabytes of memory, he was able to make VI work, but not Emacs, because <laughs> Emacs will <really. laughs> So I, I, think, I think that, you know, if there's need for new operating systems and stuff like that, that they will appear. And, uh, but I do think that it's very important that they be free software or open source. Guys? Um, can't really improve on that too much, um, except that uh, I think we're, for the next 20 years, we'll probably continue to have people writing software. Um, so for at least then, we'll probably have imperfect software. And then after that, it'll also be imperfect. We just won't know what the computer did. <laughs> <laughs> so we won't know what the bugs are. I don't really have much to add on to either point. Um, I do think that as long as, as we continue to write software, there'll, there will be bugs. <laughs> I will give a little uh, story. In the early days of the Linux kernel, um, the real-time support in Linux was very questionable. And part of the problem was because of the device drivers that were not, they, they didn't really capture the interrupt and then return control to the kernel again. They would just hold on to it. And I called up Linus, and I said, Linus, it would really help if we could improve the soft real-time support inside the kernel. And he says, well, what's wrong with the soft real-time support? I says, Linus, you've got to be kidding me. He says, no, no, I'm playing Quake. The monster has a gun. The monster goes to shoot me. I hit the button, I kill the monster. That's real-time. I said, Linus, put a real gun in the monster's hand and see what happens. <laughs> There's silence on the phone for a few minutes. He goes, yes, I see what you mean. And in the next release, the real-time was much improved. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I will go back to my, my seat and ask if it's okay. Um, forgive me if I'm a dreamer, but um, I would like to do a Linux Fest thing in Olympia, Washington, perhaps at Evergreen State College or somewhere where I live. I mean, what do you think? And would you come? And, you know, would all of the audience come, my comrades? But uh, this is the dream I've been thinking and thinking about. So, what do you think? I think you do have the opportunity to do it. Um, I believe that 
you know, with Linux being open um, and for anybody to use, you will definitely find that some people will, will want to go to a conference where wherever it might be. Um, so I definitely think it's it's a worthwhile thing if you're passionate about Linux and if you want to start your own event. I mean, all these events started with well, with local um, Linux users groups or just groups of people that want to share Linux. And I think it's it's definitely a powerful thing if you if you wanted to start something like that. Um, I'd be happy to if the scheduling works out for sure. Yeah. The biggest thing is this, if you're asking if a particular person can come, the biggest thing is the scheduling Good. and to start to do that as early as possible. It, the, 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 the more people, more famous people you want, the earlier you have to start. You know, And I would recommend starting at least a year ahead of time. Um, the other thing you should do is think about how do you, what type of a conference you want to put on. Do you want to have a special theme? Do you want the conference to be about databases? Do you want the conference to be about multimedia tools? Do you want the conference to be about something like that? And then you can ask the speakers who are around those topics to come. Uh, if you do it far enough ahead of time, you'll get into their schedule. And the other thing is that by figuring out a theme and, and something like that, you can more easily get sponsors okay, to come to that particular conference. So really think about it and, uh, and then ask. And if people are free and stuff like that. On the other hand, most of us also have real jobs. <laughs> and if we, if we spent all of our time going to conferences, it would be a lot harder to do that. The fortunate part is that the internet is almost every place and most of us have laptops and can do our work almost wherever we are. Yeah. I can say probably as some of you might know, is the most rad college in the, in the United States and in the country. And then we have thousands and thousands of social justice advocates and peace and social justice activists who live there, who have graduated there for many generations at Evergreen. And they have a need for open source and safety. And I don't know if you know John Towery case um, from uh, Fort Lewis, uh, from the ar army who, when they did the don't use our fort for peaceful purposes, you know, they were broken into, the, the activist networks were broken into, and they had, like, go, what EFF shared, you know, ghost people and other people. And it was a very famous case from 2007, 2009. It went to, you know, federal court in Tacoma and stuff like that. So there's a great need for that. Otherwise, those people's potential and, and what they want to do in life and dream, you know, in, in solidarity would be dim greatly diminished. And it, this Linux provides us those tools. Sounds good theme to me. Yeah. So, so you know, Linux Fest for peace and social justice activists. There you go. So that's the beginning. And that, that might, but it might open up to more than just Linux, right? It's it's uh, Creative Commons. It's a lot of other things that go along with that. In fact, there was an, an entire suite of tools that were specially set up so that people could publish and people could have radio stations and stuff like that. <coughs> It was outside of the, gov the government sanctioned things, right? Yeah. So these are the type of people you would have at that conference in addition to Linux people. We want it free, and I wanted it free. I just want to grow the ecosystem, the ecosystem for our products and services and whatever. Yeah. Thank you. I wrote a couple of blog articles over time uh, on the Linux magazine site about how to put on a conference and it gave you step-by-step -step stuff of, of ideas to, to, to have before you actually even announced your conference. So if you search for it there on the Linux Magazine site, you'll see it. Thank you. Thank you. So the... <laughs> <laughs> fellow was talking about how to make Linux better and uh, I had a discussion along those lines on the train here and if you don't mind my getting a little bit technical about internals of operating system design I'd like to propose an idea and this is just two guys sitting on a train if you'll uh, allow me so what we were talking about was building a microkernel. That's not the way a microkernel has been implemented if you've read how Andrew Tannenbaum did it. So you have this microkernel, and 
Uh, it's designed to be small, and it doesn't change very much. You could put it in ROM. Uh, and then it's got a shim above it that presents a um, Linux API. And it's got another shim on top of it that provides a Windows uh, API. So it's actually very much like Windows that has a POSIX shim on it, except it's backwards. Uh, and then you've got another shim uh, for uh, Mac OS X. So um, you can take all of these different operating systems and put them on the same computer because you've got this microkernel underneath that is abstracting a computer. So all of these programs, all these ecosystems run on top of the microkernel. And then if somebody comes up with a good idea for some future, you just extend it, you write a shim, and you've got this uh, OS operating system Y to avoid confusion. And so again, this is just two guys on a train in the dark bitching about how big the Linux kernel has gotten and what we can do about it. And it's theoretical computer science, and I have no idea where to go with it, but I figured this was as good, bit, as good a forum to talk about it as any. Excuse my overly simplistic answer, but have you ever heard of QEMU? <laughs> well, no. yes, as a matter of fact, we talked about that. We talked about QEMU, we talked about virtual box, um, we, uh, uh, let's see, what's the other one that we talked about? We talked about wine. And um, we weren't happy with any of those solutions because they're all, um, well, except for wine, they're all kind of hypervisor-ish. And what he wanted, what we wanted was something smaller and less overhead. So yeah, your comment about QEMU is, is really well taken. And uh, that was one of the things that we talked about and we dismissed. And may, maybe this is not such a good idea. I have no idea. <laughs> I think it might be a good idea for a talk next year. Mm -hmm. And after you've you know given some thought to it, uh, the need for a smaller microkernel-ish type of machine means that basically, you know, does your memory cost $10 a gigabyte or $1,000 a gigabyte? Um, I do a talk on performance on computer systems and compilers and things like that. And one of the things I really care about is, is code bloat that moves the accesses of the machine outside of cache. And you have cache misses all the time. So I can understand you willing to crunch this down into, into this microkernel. However, at Digital, we tried to do much that type of thing. In fact, we started off with the microkernel. We had the different uh, personalities on top of it. And we found that there was, even with the best engineering, we would still have a 2 to 3 or 4% performance hit. And we had people with stopwatches who would say, oh, your machine gives me 3,000 TPCs per second, and your machine gives me 3,010 TPCs per second. You have a microkernel, you have a monolithic kernel, you win, okay? That's all they cared about. And, you know, it's, it was, we, we could see no commercial advantage to the microkernel. Now, it's not saying the microkernels don't have an advantage. Some of them do. But it typically is in a network-based environment where you just want the microkernel communicating with, with, with personalities on other machines, right? But the overhead of doing that is phenomenal. And it has to be a really unique answer. Well, your, your point is well taken because Linus and Andrew Tenenbaum were having this argument back in the mid-1990s and um, to this day, nobody knows what Minix is, and everybody knows what Linux is. So we know what won that argument. Um, and um, so the, the, the one of the things that we, we were talking about is, is there really a need for something like this? He and I felt that, that there was on the grounds that there are some people that like Macintoshes. And for some reason, we don't understand, there are some people who like Windows. 
Um, and so we were trying to figure out a way to accommodate all these people on one machine, and maybe that can't be done. Maybe it's not technically feasible. I have no idea where to go talk about it and get more feedback other than in this room. So to go to your example, um, one of the last times that a question came up where someone had a, a, a hobbyist OS that they wanted to see if there was interest among other people, um, they posted it to a mailing list and said, I know that, I know that the herd's going to be out next year, <laughs> but in the meantime, <laughs> if anyone's interested in helping me with this hobbyist project, um, here's some, the foundations of this and, and come talk to me and maybe you could do a similar approach and see if that might be a way to gauge interest because as, as diverse and, and as this room is, there's probably some people that have uh, kernel programming backgrounds and a lot of people that don't, but on a mailing list, you're, you're casting the net way wider. So. And, and, and the good news is that there's a lot of code out there already that you could utilize to do some of the pieces of this, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to start from scratch in doing this. You can utilize a lot of these pieces. But quite frankly, you know, I don't really care that much about the size of the microkernel and stuff like that because, you know, for, for, for a lot of these people that want to have try these different operating systems, a virtual machine is good enough. And it's good enough performance, right? Because the thing that you're virtualizing is not the machine architecture, it's the operating system, right? And you can, you can, with, you know, the performance is not that bad. So this, this I think, would have to be a project of love. And when you got to a certain point, maybe you would find, like, like Kyle said, a lot of people who would be willing to work with you on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to lean into the mic. <laughs> <laughs> my, name is, my name is Mark Allen. Ever since I was a little boy, I was writing C programs, including device drivers, on the bottom of my playpen. And I'm really scared right now because of all these C++, C Sharp, and everything else. Is I'm hoping will C remain the king of everything, or is it going to go flittering away? Thank you. I'll jump, in, I'll jump into the language war here. Okay. Um, <laughs> why not? Why not? Let's do this. Okay. So, um, I mean, it's tough. It's tough with any, any language choice that's used in a lot of different systems. There is an undercurrent of certain people these days who are concerned about memory safety that they're on one side of the argument. There's a, a lot of people that are saying it's going as extreme as saying it's irresponsible to write in anything that's not, that doesn't have all of these extra memory safety handrails. Then on the other hand, you have a lot of people that want to be directly exposed to the hardware and have all of those benefits, and it's <coughs> season everything. So, I mean, Cobalt's done a lot of things too, still, and probably will be for a good long time. Go. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> first of all, you know, you have to differentiate on what you're trying to write for. I don't think I would like to use any language which does garbage collection inside of the kernel, and particularly in a real-time kernel. Because I could see it now. Your nuclear power plant is melting, <laughs> and inside the kernel of your system it says, oh, yo, wait a minute, I have to do garbage collection. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, what was happening? Oh, the nuclear power plant, oh, it's gone. <laughs> So there are some places where C, with all of its horrible features, is still a really good language. It's better than writing an assembly language or machine language, right? Which is what Ken and Dennis originally wrote the kernel in. So, but in other places, you know, in graphical interfaces and things like that, C++ or some other types of languages may be appropriate. There's a lot of people who like writing in Lisp, okay? Particularly people who write certain certain text editors, <laughs> and uh, you know, I I've, I've I've programmed in more languages than people have. The Carter has little liver pills. Okay, if you remember that set. So, you know, pick the language that you feel meets the problem, and that's that's the best thing. 
C will never, well, I will say it would never go away. Unlikely it's going to go away soon. Thank you. Mm. That was, that hit the nail on the head, I believe. That's, you know, you have to choose the language that fits your purpose. You shouldn't choose um, the language that's going to, to introduce an unnecessary overhead for the problem you're trying to solve. So I agree with the, with the yeah, go ahead. But there are languages to stay away from. <laughs> yes. I, I would agree. <clears throat> when I was in school 50 years ago, I had this professor, we took this course, Comparative Languages. And one of the languages that we compared was APL. Now, we took this 40-line Fortran program and we rewrote it in a bunch of different languages. And APL was the last language we were going to write it in. And the professor, with a twinkle in his eye, said, the person who writes this program, this 40-line Fortran program, and the fewest number of APL lines wins, right? So most of us got it down to three lines. Some of us got it down to two lines, and this one kid who was definitely the brightest kid in the whole class, his name is David Erb, to this day I remember his name, he got it down to one line. And he came in, we ran the data through it, sure enough, it, it was exactly the same as the Fortran program. And then the professor, with the same <laughs> twinkle in his eye, said, David, would you explain how it worked? And David went, <laughs> And could not. <laughs> and the professor said, when did you finish this? Now, this was a 9 o'clock in the morning class. David said, I finished it at 3 o'clock this morning. <laughs> and so, six hours later, he had not a clue to how to describe how that program worked. And the professor said to us, let this be a lesson. APL is a write-only language. <laughs> It was wonderful to use as a little hand calculator for doing matrix manipulation and stuff like that, but it used its own character set. You, you had to paste the APL characters to the side of the keyboard, and you would lean back to type it like this, and you had a special IBM Selectric ball with the character set that you had to replace the old one to do it, right? It was horrendous. <laughs> APL. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lean over, I'll just kneel. It's a good mic. I'll so kneel before you. How uh, about that? <laughs> 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 um, this is hopefully for something different. If you were stranded on an island with unlimited power supply but could only bring one computer, what would you bring? Hey, Wolf supercomputer. 120,000 nodes. You said an unlimited power supply. I mean, my first answer was going to be a ThinkPad, but then that's, yeah, that tops that. Um, I'd probably do the navigation computer that's attached to a, a sailboat. Um. <laughs> ah, but Interesting, interesting. So, of course, we all think about digital computers, okay? But there are also analog computers. Yes. And analog computers were used for a long time because digital computers were not fast enough to do certain things, like aim your gun while your ship is rolling like this, okay? Analog computers could keep up with that because they were thousands of times faster than digital computers of the day. The problem with analog computers was that they typically drifted over time and with temperature and things like that, so you constantly had to keep calibrating them. However, with nanotechnology, we can now make analog switches that have bonds on them so tight, so hard, that they don't drift. And so we can actually create new computing elements that have the speed of the old analog computers, but don't drift to do it. It. So now we're, we're looking in labs to create these type of computers. Kind of an analog to this is that most of us are used to the regular digital computers with the registers and stuff like that, but how many of you have heard of FPGAs? Yes. Woo! Yes. 
FPGAs have dropped in price dramatically, and more and more people are looking how to program those to be able to have much faster computation, particularly of subroutines which are, which are standard subroutines. And so you might be able to have some subroutines written that are handled by an FPGA. You call the subroutine and you get the answer back dramatically faster. Okay. Actually, recently, <coughs> Lena said that if he hadn't gotten interested in writing kernels and that if he was starting over today, he probably would spend a lot of time learning how to program FPGAs. About what? Would? Well, that's an Asimovian starting point right there. <laughs> I just wish people would read some of the stuff he's already written. You know? <laughs> I wish people would read iRobot and really understand it. And then go and talk about artificial intelligence and why it's not going to take over the world. Okay. Too many people who talk about artificial intelligence don't talk about it correctly. Let's not say artificial intelligence, let's say inorganic intelligence. Because your mind is made up of synapses and neurons. And there's a certain gentleman by the name of Alan Turing who believed that you could program these inorganic materials to have the same consciousness as you know, human beings do. It's just that we don't know how to do that yet. And that up until now, our, our CPUs have been too slow, our memory is too small. But if you look at things like resistive memory, where there's a single ion which, which generates a one or a zero, and you, you, you access it by moving that ion through the substrate, your access time is about twice that of standard RAM, but the density is such that something the size of a human fist could hold all of human in, of human knowledge, and it's not volatile. So if you turn off the electricity, it still remembers. And you put all these things together with a reasonable production price, and that's really a phenomenal thing. You know, we're we're, we're coming into this thing now where in the next ten years, I, I'm hoping that some of these things which are right now in the research stages are going to be in advanced development and even in production. Imagine if something like resistive memory, which is a solid state, low power, highly dense thing was to come in and be produced at a reasonable cost overnight. Every single hard drive maker, every single flash maker is out of business. That would be interesting. It would also make all of the new container based packaging systems super viable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Edwin, I'll take my turn. Um, what what was it? Do you remember a particular event or a particular situation that moved you from being aware of <coughs> open source to being a strong advocate and contributor to open source? And was there a particular spark? I had a spark. <laughs> Tell us about your spark. <laughs> I was a university student in 1969. I was a co-op student for the Western Electric Company, the manufacturing arm of the telephone company. And as an electrical engineering student, I was almost electrocuted by 13,600 volts and 800 amps. And then I went over to software. <laughs> Where a paper cut was one of the most dangerous things that was going to happen to me. And instead of having to deal with Fourier analysis and Laplace transforms, I only had to do with like, you know, adding, subtracting really fast, okay? But that was, that was electrical engineering to computers. And what moved me to free software was that I worked, I started in a time where there's no such thing as a professional programmer. I covered some of this in my talk. And you dealt with open source because there wasn't any one computer system that really made it worthwhile to create a binary distribution. 
From there, I went to teach. And of course, I wanted to have open source for my students. From there, I went to Bell Labs, where they created Unix, and we got our Unix systems in open source. Right? From there, I went to Digital Equipment Corporation. We created binary, copy, binary distributions of Unix, but I had access to the source. And so when I met Linus Torvalds, all of a sudden it was hit me in the face that my customers could not have access to the same source code that I had access to. And it was stopping them from solving their problems. And I said, this, this is wrong. I first saw Linux as a way that people could do research in large address spaces. Do you know how big 64 bits is? 32 bits is 4 billion bytes. 64 bits is 4 billion times 4 billion bytes. Or you can store 128 bytes for every square millimeter on the surface of the Earth, including all the oceans. Or you can store a gigabyte of data every second of the day for the next 5,386 years. And yes, I did calculate in leap years. <laughs> So I wanted people to be able to do research more easily and to share their research results and stuff like that. And so in a university or in a school, there's no reason at all that you should be using proprietary software. And all the people, all the people who say to me, well, we have to teach Microsoft Office in the school because that's what people use on the outside to do business. I say to you, pardon me, but you're telling me that your students, you're training to be good enough to build bridges, to build schools, to design computers, to make operating systems. You're telling me that they're that smart, that they could do, they could be doctors and lawyers. They're that smart, but they're too stupid to pick up Microsoft Office for Dummies and learn it in a day. And you can't have it both ways. Your students are either smart <coughs> or they're stupid. I have the same problem with GPU people who tell me, oh no, you know, you, you, you know, if, we, if we expose our, the source code of our firmware, people, will, our competitors will know how we make our GPUs. Really? <laughs> You're telling me that your competitors are smart enough that they can look at the way your firmware is tickling the hardware registers of your, and figure out what the circuits are inside of your GPU, but they're too stupid to take a disassembler and take your firmware and figure out what it's doing. <laughs> you can't have it both ways. They're either too smart or too stupid. So this drives me crazy all the time. Sorry, I went on a rant. <laughs> so, um, oh. oh, we're not all answering the, okay. You don't all have to answer every question, it's okay. <laughs> okay, because that was a tough one. Um, you just have to yeah. elbow John and then <laughs> <laughs> Careful with that. Well, <laughs> If I can, I mean, I have a, a brief one, uh, just because I, because I was like, th no, you're um, yeah. So I had like the the spark, as it were, that made me into free software sort of came at two phases. Um, the first was in college, like I said before, um, when someone introduced me to this, and as someone who was in a computer science program that was all teaching computer science on proprietary software, you know, we had it was Windows stack, and we were writing graphical programs and all of that. Um, when I discovered that I had an operating system where as someone who's learning C and C++ that I could inspect the code of the very programs I was running if I had a problem with it, modify it, that opened this whole world to me and then that started like down the road. So like a lot of people I got into it for the free beer at the beginning or the open source aspect of it. It wasn't uh, the free software aspect of it came later. Um, seeing the code was the big deal at first, and then later I started realizing how important it was that everybody else had that freedom because it also meant I down the road could have that freedom as well. Um, the second spark came after uh, Linux Journal died uh, a little bit over a year ago, and I realized that it was great that I was able to be gainfully employed through my life because of Linux because I happened to get into it at the time before it really took off. So I was fortunate that this thing that I love to do for fun, I could get a job doing too. Fantastic. And rode that way for a while, working for a lot of companies on the side. But on the, only on the side was I really doing anything 
for the community. Um, writing articles, doing that sort of thing, which is a great contribution, but um, that's where I sort of left it. Um, then after Linux Journal do died, and fortunately it's back to life now, but I realized, well, but what am I doing the eight hours a day um, or more that I'm devoting most of my energies into? Is that promoting free software at all? And I realized, well, not really. I should do something to change that. Um, and that's, you know, that's when my mind flipped and realized I should really be spending, because I have the luxury after being in this industry long enough to make that choice, that I should make that choice and devote my day job as well, in all those energies into free software. So, um, I've seen some really zany alternative OSs out there, which seem like they were designed for an alternate universe where like none of the rules apply. And I'm not just being like, haha, like Windows or something, like yeah, stuff. <laughs> Hannah Montana Linux is pretty great, but that's what that's what I was about to say is Temple OS is designed for a world where a user never makes mistakes and it's all in ring zero and you can just dereference random numbers and the shell is a JIT of C. And then there's Urbit, which is purely functional and runs in the cloud on a blockchain or something. But these are all like they're essentially they're almost they're almost like art, and I've heard people describe them as art. Do you think that a weird operating system can count as art? Um. Next question? <laughs> I might even ask, why is the operating system weird? I mean, you know, it's somebody decided that they wanted to do something different, and they did it. I mean, who's to say that that's weird or not? Temple OS is weird. <laughs> <laughs> APL is weird. <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to think about exactly what is art. Yeah, it's subjective. It's what you yeah. think. And I think that these people obviously thought that whatever they invented was worth inventing. Yes. You know, whether other people agree with that, I mean, that's art. I mean, I, somebody looks at a piece of art, oh, I love it. And other people look at the piece of art, I hate it, right? Mm -hmm. So? I mean, they're certainly creative. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, I, yes, I, I would agree that they are arts. Um, those operating systems are. And I would also agree that people should have the... the I mean, the people should have the freedom to design something like that. And if somebody calls it weird, then that's their opinion. And with art being subjective, one, one person could say that it's, you know, this is a bad thing. Another person could say it's a good thing. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's software. I mean, were you suggesting it was performance art? Um, <laughs> or, yeah, I mean, so that's... Defining art's interesting to me just because it seems like a lot of people are subconsciously not realizing that they kind of want to d diminish the word craft. Um, by they, they, There's a notion that craft is here, but art is way up here. And I don't know, to me, there's a lot of value in craft. And there's a lot of things that, that um, people do, whether they're... Um, writing software or, or doing any other sort of human endeavor that I think falls more firmly into craft than art. Um, and I don't necessarily think that that uh, lowers its value at all. I think there's a big value into craftsmanship. A lot of people like to say that their code is art, but I think a lot of them, if they thought about what they're trying to say is, I'm a craftsman and I put a lot of care and concern into my craft less than I'm trying to make a statement about humanity in the way that I implemented this function. <laughs> when we first came out with digital Unix that was based on the OSF1 code from <laughs> OSF, um, but leap it or not, a server operating system took all of 64 megabytes of RAM to boot. I'll say that again. A server operating system took 64 megabytes of RAM to boot and run. And our product manager said, that's too much. 
we have to use less because RAM was very expensive. So the goal was to make the operating system take 32 megabytes of RAM to boot and run. And it took the engineers a year of going through the code, compressing things like libraries, doing trade-offs of time versus space, CPU versus you know memory techniques, to get it down to the point where it would actually boot and run in 32 megabytes. And everybody kind of expected that the operating system was going to be a lot slower because some of these trade-offs were CPU versus memory. But the really weird thing was it ran 7% faster because more of the code was staying in cache. And the alpha had a huge amount of cache. So by compressing all of this stuff, more of the code stayed in cache with fewer cache misses and the whole operating system ran faster. That was craftsmanship. That was people taking their expertise and making the stuff better, more reliable, more dependable. And that was actually what Ken Olson loved to do as an engineer. That was engineering to him. Taking standards and implementing them in the fastest possible, most stable way. Craftsmanship. My question refers to the one just before the last, which is I have, I think I've found a spark that's got me wanting to get more involved in open source software, uh, but I'm sort of dancing on my hands right now and trying to find a place to put it in which to burn. Um, and so my question would be, where, what, what are some good resources for getting into it? Um, and, and are there any like, Good tutorials that you can point towards or even you know maybe specifically for people who are not coders like I have I, I know the very first thing about knock and that's about all that I have here um, so anybody who's who's maybe technical but not not a programmer but do you have any advice for how to get involved I would say the first thing is to write down what your idea is why you think it's important why you, you know, any, any ideas you have about this. There are some books actually um, about starting an open source project and giving you an ideas of, of ways of doing that. And also if you, if you go out onto the net and grab for that type of thing, you know, how do I start a project or how do I get going? Do you have specific references? I'd have to, I'd have, you know, see me afterwards, give me your contact, I can do, I can look for you, okay? Because unfortunately, I've got lots of stuff in my head, and it's it's the end of the the week, and and, and I'm not tired. <laughs> <laughs> but I will I would look for you for that. Are you referring to starting your own project or contributing to an existing one? Um, both. I mean, I, I already do a little bit of documentation work, you know, fix a typo there, and maybe provide some steps for something that wasn't very clear. But mm -hmm. um, I'm very much stuck in that place personally. Do writing documentation is actually, it's very valuable. Um, I would say that if you're using open source software, um, which hopefully you are, um, you know, that documentation for that software, if there isn't one, it would be really great if you could write some and then contribute to the existing documentation. However, it's, it's learning the intricacies of the software and then going and being able to report, for example, bugs. That's another step that I often encourage, is people who can report bugs and um, reproduce bugs and leave comments on bugs, um, it's, it's very, very valuable because otherwise it's time taken away from developers who are, who are already busy enhancing the code. So documentation is where I would start and bug reports, whether it's repro trying to reproduce one, um, finding the cause of one, just bug hunting. So um, I've heard, I mean, I've heard that refrain before. People have always suggested it's like, go in there and make documentation, but it's um, often something of a tautology. It's, uh, I'm not technical enough to figure out how the program works, mm -hmm. and so it's like, well, write documentation for this program you don't have the ability to understand. Um, and I, I can understand that. It depends on the program, though, I would say. Um, if you're talking about a simple program, just, it, it, for example, I would say if, if LibreOffice didn't have documentation, 
um, you could poke around in LibreOffice and probably write some good documentation. It's from the perspective of somebody who just simply uses it. Um, whereas if you're talking about more of a like a, a library or something more low level than a simple graphical user interface program, it's it it, it I can see how it can become difficult. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of the people that really understand what's happening behind the scenes on software are horrible at writing documentation about it. Um, just like they're often horrible writing the interface to use the thing. Like it, if you've used, like say, IP tables ever. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's clear that it's the person who wrote is super smart and the interface to it reflects how the internals work almost one to one in a weird, weird way. So if you understand it, awesome. Um, you picked a really great time to want to contribute in a non-technical way to free software. Um, over, you know, over the last decade at least, there's been sort of a refrain of, yes, we want non-technical contributors and everything's valuable. However, people actually mean it now. Um, before, everyone knew it was the right thing to say, and they said, yes, you're an equal member of the community. Um, but no one really, be a lot of, well, some people believed it. A lot of people said that and didn't believe it, but now people are actually believe it um, and st are starting to treat people who aren't writing software as, as the equal contribution that they are. <laughs> Um, and understanding the value that's there. So you picked a really great time. I, I would say just like if you were going to enter a free software project and wanted to contribute and you were a developer, um, I if you were coming from that standpoint, I would say find an itch that you want to scratch, find a project that you love that has this little thing, the problem with it, and fix, start by fixing that. I would say the same thing in terms of either documentation or whatever contribution based on your skills. Find a piece of software or a project that you already are passionate about um, that has that one little thing, either the documentation's wrong, or you don't like it, or it's incomplete, or whatever it is, and then start there, and then find which, which aspects of that you can grow into. So there are documentation developers, and there's documentation reviewers. And sometimes the person who's developing the documentation is the absolutely worst reviewer, because they've written what they thought they were writing, but they, you know, the person who comes along fresh doesn't understand it. So you could you know, go through a, a piece of documentation and say, this part is not clear. I don't understand it. You know? And then go back to the people that wrote the documentation. Could you clarify this? Or this is what I think you meant. Is this what you meant? And that helps too. You know? and, you know, and over time, you gain more information. You gain more knowledge. And so you start to move up the chain as it is. A friend of mine was a really good security person. His name is Ken Kaur. But he was kind of tired of doing security, so he wanted to work on a web browser, and he decided to work on the Apache web browser. And he went and fixed bugs, you know, and so he would go through and fix bugs. But when he was writing, you know, when you fix a bug, you have to create the code, and a lot of times the best thing is to create the code in the style of the people who wrote it. So he would create his, you know, create the patch, he would submit it, and people say, well, it's a decent patch, but it's not quite in the style Would you go back Sometimes it's frustrating for people, you know, but eventually he got it right and they met, matched his style and they kept fixing more and more bugs and after a while they said, hey, you're really good at fixing bugs. We have these things that we wanted to do, but we didn't have time to do it. Would you mind doing that? And so he would start to write new code and submit it. And after a while they said, you know, you're really good at doing this. Why don't you become a core developer on the Apache team, which is what he does now. And he's actually paid by IBM to do it. So you work through this, you gain knowledge, you gain experience, and you move you know, up the thing. You, if you wanted to go into writing proprietary code, you'd be doing the same thing, right? But with open source code, you, you get more visible. You know, where is the list of developers for Microsoft Office? You'll never find it, right? But when you look at the list of developers for LibreOffice, there they are. And so people can look at your code, they can see what you've done, they can look at your documentation, they can see what you've done. It becomes your portfolio for getting a job. Thank you. There are other, also other project management related tasks that a lot of open source projects need or technical skills like that aren't programming, like build pipelines that are breaking and there's all of these things that need to be done if you get involved in the community that you know is, is something you care about marketing for projects mm -hmm. you know helping them become more known and stuff like that you know uh, 
There's lots of different things. In my job, in, in my career in programming, I was a programmer, I was a systems administrator, I was an educator, I wrote articles for magazines, I was a product manager, I did technical marketing. You know, I became a, eventually a couple times CEOs of companies. I'm a chairman of the board now. All of these things use different skills that I had, right? And that's the great thing about computer science and computer, you know, the computer industry, that there's so many jobs that use so many different skills. It never becomes boring. The worst thing in life that can ever happen to you is to become bored. <laughs> in 50 years, I've never had a single day when I was bored. No, wait a minute. April the 3rd, 1965. I was bored. No, <laughs> and to add on to an earlier point, I think one of the best things you can do is just join the IRC channel or whether it's whatever platform they're on. And, you know, it wouldn't hurt to ask, you know, if you have a certain skill set. And it's, it's different for some projects than others. I will admit that. But I found it sometimes hurts to ask. Yeah, some, sometimes. <laughs> well, you know, in the projects that I'm involved in, I typically try to make it welcoming for newcomers. However, you know, that's one of the, that's one thing you can do. And even if you don't ask the question, just idling in the IRC channel, you can see sort of what what people do what, and where you know somebody might mention something. Oh, I wish we had somebody to do that, or something along those lines. And just having your finger on the pulse of a project that you want to contribute to is valuable as well. Maybe you have skills as an artist. Maybe you have skills in writing prose. Maybe you know all sorts of different skills that can be useful to a project. Yeah. I, hate, I hate to do this because we have one more really excellent question, but I do have to keep the trains running on time. Um, that is why I have the conductor hat. And Bill was desperate to start his raffle right at four. Oh. Um, so one more round of applause for our board. <laughs> <laughs>